Like many parents in the church, I suppose, um, my husband and I wanted to teach our children the importance of giving from the time that they were very young. So when our son Andy was about three years old, uh, we thought it was time to take a first step in teaching him about generosity, and we thought we'd do that by giving him a quarter every Sunday and letting him drop it in the offering plate as it came down the pew. Now, I think it's important for me to say that Andy was our first child, and we tended to be a little idealistic sometimes about the way Andy would respond to things. So we had imagined him dropping his quarter into the plate with great glee each week and experiencing the joy of Jesus in his heart as he did that. Oh my goodness, friends. Okay, so <clears throat> things went okay at first. They got off to a good start on that first Sunday of the great quarter experiment. Uh, my husband gave Andy his quarter when we sat down in the pew, and Andy was just thrilled. He clutched that quarter, he held it so tight because he didn't want to drop it, and, and Tripp said to him, now when the plate comes by, you get to give the quarter, and he was so excited about that, and we watched his excitement grow through the service, and when the ushers fanned out finally for the offering with the plates, he started wiggling in his chair. I mean, he couldn't even sit still, and Tripp and I were looking at each other like, we did good, he's learning something here, this is great. So here comes the plate. It gets to Andy for the magic moment, and Tripp says, honey, put your quarter in, and suddenly it was a whole new world. Andy balked and said, no, and held it. So Tripp said, now, honey, you need to put the, the quarter in. Again, Andy said, no, and clutched it to his chest. I tried, Andy, you need to give the quarter now. No, and he started crying at this point, and not the soft crying friends, the open mouth sobbing really loud, crying, and we felt every head in the congregation begin to turn in our direction. And so at that point, I sort of gently pried open his fingers, and thank goodness he didn't fight me. He dropped the quarter in. It went on down the pew in the plate, and at that point, Andy was completely inconsolable. He kept shouting no and crying very, very loudly, and finally, my husband looked at me and said, I gotta take him out. Parents, have you ever been there? Okay. So, <laughs> Andy goes out with Tripp on the center aisle, screaming all the way out the back door. I'm sure the pastor was really relieved when the door shut behind them. Well, they got out into the narthex, and, and Tripp got down and, and said, now, Andy, why were you so upset? And between sobs, Andy said, that was my money, he said. That was my money. Well, Tripp tried to explain very patiently that the quarter was actually a gift to God, but Andy wasn't buying it. As far as he was concerned, he had been robbed, and he wanted everybody in the universe to know it. That was his quarter, and he wanted to keep it. Now, I promised him when I told him I was going to tell this story today that I would also say to you that Andy has grown up to be a very generous person. He has. But reflecting on that experience with the quarter, there were a couple of things that we could learn. One, three-year-olds will surprise you. And two, it's one thing to give from joy, and it's another thing to give out of obligation. It's one thing to be forced to give, and it's another thing altogether to give willingly out of a generous heart. And friends, over the years in the churches that I've served, I've heard a lot of people talk about giving to the church in terms of obligation, and they, they do this in a very well-meaning way. You hear people talk about it in terms of need. We give because the church needs our money. You've heard people make those appeals, right? They usually go something like this. We must give because the church has bills to pay. The church has to mow the lawn and water the shrubs and keep the lights on and keep the air conditioning going and buy supplies and pay the staff, etc., etc. So please give because the church needs the money. Well, friends, that's true. Uh, on, on a certain level, the church does need the money to operate. We do have bills to pay. We do have to buy supplies and maintain our campus and pay our staff. That's all true. But I don't believe 
that that's the primary reason that anybody should give to the church. I don't. I don't believe that at all. And so this morning, as I begin a three-part sermon series on generosity, on giving, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that the church needs our money. You know, the reality, friends, is that we need to give. We need to give. We need to give to be whole people. We need to give to know real joy. We need to give to know real meaning and fulfillment. We need to give to grow beyond ourselves. We need to give to keep our priorities straight. God doesn't call us to give because the church has bills to pay. God calls on us to practice generosity to give so that, you see, we can be truly whole, healthy people in the faith. And I think that's one of the reasons that Jesus talks so much about money in the Scriptures. You all know that, right? Jesus talks a lot about money. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, for example, about one of every six verses touches on the issue of money or wealth. And of the 39 parables told by Jesus, 11 are about the relationship with a between a person and their money. Jesus understood how important money is to us. It was back then, too. I mean, let's face it, the average person spends the bulk of their life either trying to earn money or manage it or both, and a lot of us spend a tremendous amount of time worrying about money. Money takes up a lot of uh, mind share, if you will, for a lot of us. It was the same in Jesus' day, and, and then, too, Jesus understood that money can be very seductive, that we can fall in love with it, that we can see money as the source of our ultimate security, that we can believe that money is the ticket to the good life. We can love our money so much that it becomes our God, and I don't say that lightly. Money can just move right in to the top place of priority in our life. It can become more important to us than even the real living God. You know, one of my favorite stories about Jesus and money is in the Gospel of Mark, and it's one that I bet you know. It's called the widow's mite. You know that one? Most of us who grew up in the church learned it in Sunday school. Mark says that, that Jesus goes to the temple and he sits down opposite the place they called the treasury, where people put their offerings. It was really just a big box. And I just find that fascinating in and of itself, that in this huge temple complex, and it was really big, that that's the place Jesus would choose to go, someplace where he could sit and watch people give. Well, he does that. I imagine him sitting discreetly out of the line of sight and just watching the offering box. And the text tells us that several wealthy people come by and put in big amounts of money. But then, Jesus sees a poor widow come to the offering box, and she drops in two copper coins, which together are worth less than a penny. And Jesus is really touched by this. So he calls his disciples to him and says, truly I tell you, that woman has given more than anybody. This poor widow, she's given more than anybody because the wealthy people gave out of their excess. But she in her poverty has given all she had to live on, everything. And friends, what is it that Jesus wants us to understand about generosity from that story? What is he trying to tell us? Do you think Jesus is trying to tell us that God needed those two copper coins? That God needed that poor widow's money? Mm. Strictly speaking, I don't think so. No, I don't think that God needed her money any more than I need the gifts that my children have given to me over the years and still do. I didn't need the little paper angel that Ellen labored over, over when she was in kindergarten and I still put out at Christmas time. 
I didn't need the strawberry candle that Andy saved up money for and bought me for my birthday when he was in middle school. I didn't need those things. I could buy things like that for myself. But my children gave me those gifts for the same reason that I've given gifts to my parents over the years and still do. Those gifts are an expression of love, of relationship. Their value goes way beyond any dollar amount. They represent priority. They tell me when I receive them from my children that I'm important to them. When I give them, they tell my parents how important they are to me. And friends, it's the same with God. God doesn't need our money. But when we give, we are expressing love and relationship when it comes to God. Generosity, you see, reinforces again and again and again that God is our highest priority, our highest value, and that it's our relationship with God, not money, not any material thing, that's the foundation of our life. And I love the way the Apostle Paul talks about this. In our text this morning, he calls this kind of generosity the grace of giving. I love that. The grace of giving. Because I believe giving is a grace. It's an extension of the grace of God. Now, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, which was better off than a lot of the other ones. And he says to them, I I urge you to give. I urge you to share. Because God and Jesus Christ has been so generous with you. I want to read these words that he wrote verbatim because they're so beautiful. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Friends, don't we know that We give in response to that grace that we have received. That God and Jesus Christ has given us the richest gift there could ever be. This forgiveness, this grace, this incredible transforming love. We receive that with joy, do we not? And then it's our joy to give back to share with others in Christ's holy name. In fact, friends, I think that's one of the keys to life, is to recognize that we need to give because in the giving, in this grace of giving, we know joy. You know, I know some of you uh, are aware that in uh, my appointment just before this one at Flower Mound UMC up in the Dallas area, uh, that church built a sanctuary edition while I was the pastor there. Uh, I came to that church in 2011. It had been founded in 1995, and they were still worshiping in their tiny fellowship hall when I showed up. Within a couple of years, we were bursting out of that space, and it was finally time to build, and they had a great dream. They felt God had put on their heart. They wanted to build a cathedral-style sanctuary, not inexpensive to build, 550 seats, with a pipe organ and stained glass and state-of-the-art technology, and they felt called to build a new narthex and a welcome center and a cafe and a bride's room and restrooms, very important new restrooms, and a great, big, modern, beautiful nursery for the children because there were so many little ones there that our existing nurseries were overrun. Well, this was a huge project, the biggest one this church had ever taken on, and it would take tremendous sacrifice, real generosity to make it a reality, but we felt called to do it together, and more than 100 people worked on the capital campaign, and we, we launched that campaign praying that on our Commitment Sunday we would have enough to build. Well, a few weeks into that campaign, I was sitting in my office one afternoon, and there was a knock on my office door, and it was a woman I recognized from the church, an elderly woman, a widow, that I had gotten to know well. 
And she said, uh, can I come in and talk to you? And, and she came in and shut the door, and she said, I have a gift for the sanctuary build, and, and really, it's a gift for the children. I love the children so much, and I want them to have that nursery. And she handed me a little cardboard box. Well, when I took it from her, I could hear in the box some change in there moving around. And I said, can I open the box? And she said, sure. And I opened it, and inside the box, sure enough, there was some change in there and some bills, too, quite a few of them. And then there was a little folded up piece of, of paper, and I unfolded that piece of paper and saw on it that she had sort of calendared out the weeks. Apparently, she had been working on this project for several months, way before we even started the campaign. And week by week, she had written a, 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 out a total, a small amount of money. So it would say week one, 75 cents. Week two, eight dollars. Week three, four dollars, and it, so forth, and it, it went down the sheet, and I said, Shirley, what is this? And she said, well, I played a game, you see, I played a game. I wanted so badly to give. So every week, I played a game to see how much money I could trim off of my grocery bill, and then the money that I saved, I put in the box. Friends, you have to understand that this woman was on a fixed income, very small. This was a person who sometimes had to choose between medicine and food, okay? This is a great sacrifice for her. And she said, I clipped coupons and I, I gave up things that I thought were luxuries. And then she said, I haven't had cookies in two months. I still uh, tear up thinking about her giving up the cookies so she could give. I was so touched by this. I hugged her and thanked her. She was so full of joy. She took such tremendous pleasure in giving me that little box. And you know what, friends? To this day, she is one of my spiritual heroes. When I grow up, I want to be like her. Because she understood this grace of giving. She knew the love of Jesus in her heart in such a powerful way. She had experienced that grace in her life. And she knew she needed to give back. So she did in the best way that she knew how. Wouldn't surprise you to know, would it, that she was so beloved in that congregation. Just beloved. Because she was generous in every way, not just with her money, but with her time and with her love. My friends, I've read many times that money can't buy you love, and it can't. It also can't buy you purpose or fulfillment. And really and truly, it cannot buy you ultimate security, no matter what the commercials say on TV. It really cannot. In an ironic twist of faith, only giving, only giving brings those things into our life. My friends, our God doesn't need our money. But we, we children of God need to give to no wholeness, to no fulfillment, to no meaning, to keep our priorities straight. We need to give. And if we can lean into that and live into that, then all of us can experience that grace of giving. Will you pray with me? Most loving God, we give you thanks for you have been so incredibly generous with us. You came to us in Jesus Christ. You lived our life. You died our death. You took on our sin. You bless us every day with your holy presence, with grace. Lord, give us the courage and the boldness to let go of the idea that money will bring us happiness instead. Lord, let us follow your example and lean into the truth. 
that is generosity, that is giving, that brings joy. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.